Well, our illustration for today as we go into our message, our illustration is going to be about families. Do you like your family? <laughs> Let's hear a shout out for your family. Come on, you've got, a, you've got an awesome family. You really do. You might be saying, and some of you in your minds are saying no, but you're, you're going to learn. You're going to learn. Okay, so the first question that I want you to think about in your own mind, and I'm going to share a little bit about my family, uh, but it's mostly so you can think about your family. The question is, how has your family shaped you? So there are many ways that we are shaped by our families, actually so much so that it often seems impossible to escape the way that we were shaped by our families for good, mostly for good, actually, sometimes for not so good, right? So let's think about the, the ways that our families have shaped us go all the way from the silly little things all the way to really important things. So here's one silly little thing uh, that my, my mother accidentally built into my life, okay? So every time I get to the end of a loaf of bread, what's left at the end of a loaf of bread? The heel, right? The last piece, right? Or some people call it something else, but the heel of the bread, okay? And so, you know, sometimes people don't want to eat that. Kids don't want to eat it. So it's kind of crushed and it's squished up. I cannot throw out the heel of the bread. Why? Because the whole time I was growing up, my mother said, whenever we would get to the end of a loaf of bread, she said, in this family, we eat the heel. In this family, we eat the heel. And she said it with such sincerity. She must have got it. I think she got it from her grandmother. And so probably ever since bread, sliced bread has been a thing, my family on my mom's side has been a family that eats the heel. And so I, I, I find it very difficult to throw away the heel of the bread, even though really I'm not saving any money. Come on, really? Is it really that important? Okay, other things my mom also on, on the other side, big things my mom built into me, uh, sort of a tenacity to never quit. That's something that I'm really, I'm really glad that she built into me. If I think about my son Carter, right, his, his mom's father, so his grandfather, his maternal grandfather was a big military guy and his mom grew up in the military and what is Carter doing now? He is, my oldest son, is a Marine, a U.S. Marine. So there's, things are built into us by our families that are very hard to escape. Some of them are quite obvious and direct, like you see how, you know, your parents built something directly into your life because they did it over and over again, like those things that I've just shared. Some things that, that run in our families, they're clearly handed down in our families, but they're super weird. You ever have any of those super weird things that you almost don't know how it gets passed on through the family, but it recurs sometimes throughout generations, okay? Here's an interesting one for me. This is a picture. Do you guys, do you guys recognize these people at all? No, I, and you wouldn't, okay? These, these are my, some of my relatives this is, well, there's a little bit of debate, actually, about who this is. My cousin, my second cousin, says that this is, uh, this is Caleb and Louisa Whiting. Uh, so Caleb Whiting was my double great-grandfather. But I, I don't know, just judging by their clothing, I actually wonder if this might not be Richard Whiting, who is my triple great-grandfather. Because Caleb Whiting would have been like turn of the 20th century, and this just looks like late 1800s, unless they're just dressed really old school, okay? So this is Caleb and Louisa, and so this is my, if it's Caleb and Louisa, this is my grandfather's grandfather. That's who it is. Yeah, and there's his dog, right? I, I would love for Bella, my dog, to be able to play with this dog. That's a cool looking dog, yeah. Uh, they, they look like awesome people. Different culture than we have now, maybe, in some ways. But, so, but the interesting thing here is that in my family, on my father's side, okay, everybody's American. I originally grew up in the United States, and my family immigrated on my dad's side, on the Whiting side. My last name is Whiting. They immigrated to what is now the United States like way long time ago, like way before the United States was the United States, like mid or early to mid-1700s. But in my family, separated sometimes by a number of generations, 
is this tradition of moving up to Canada for a while and doing stuff in Canada. Seriously. So Caleb and Louisa had a homestead. I don't know if it was in what is now Manitoba or Saskatchewan, but one of those. They had a homestead in the prairies north of North Dakota, which is now Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Crazy, huh? So drop down to his grandson, my grandfather. This is a picture of my grandfather, Douglas Whiting. And this is me and my brother. This is back in the 80s. Can you tell which one is me? Yeah, we look, we look, <laughs> we look very different. So my grandfather, okay, after the, after the homestead in, in uh, Saskatchewan or Manitoba, they moved, the whole family moved down to Southern California and lived there for generations. Some of them still live in Southern California. I was born there. But my grandfather, so two generations removed from the Canadian connection, he completely independently, through his church, ends up spending a lot of time here in British Columbia in the Lower Mainland working with Trinity Western University. Super weird, huh? Okay. And I mean, interesting connection it, in our church. If you, know, if you know the McEwens in our church, Rebecca McEwen's dad, who works at Trinity Western University, was, was close friends with my grandpa. And actually, when she was a little girl, Rebecca stayed at my grandpa's house in Southern California. She doesn't remember it. Isn't that so weird? And then again, so then completely independent, I didn't come up to Canada because of my grandfather at all. In fact, I wanted nothing to do with what he was doing because he was a Christian. I didn't grow up as a Christian. I thought he was crazy. He prayed for me every morning for 15 years and then God did big stuff in my life. But I came up to Canada following things that God had put in my life in a totally different way and ended up in a very similar place to where he had been actually, in some cases, working with people who he had known. God does weird stuff in families. Sometimes it seems like you can't escape your family. You can't escape the things that are passed down in a family. Now, this is important. So, so you should be thinking about what are the things in your family. Okay, this is a little bit of a longer illustration, but you're going to see why this is necessary today in just a minute when we get to the second half of Romans chapter 5. Now, this is a place in the lower mainland. Does anybody know where this is? Nobody knows. Oh, you guys live too far from Vancouver. This is a place in Vancouver. This is a, an image of Little Mountain in Vancouver near Queen Elizabeth Park. And until, I mean, I guess it still is a BC housing complex, but this is the old one. Okay? Now, sometimes, most of the time, most of what is passed down to us in our families is actually really good. It's a kind of culture, a kind of inheritance. One time this, uh, I had a, a close friend of mine say that the thing, the inheritance she received from her parents, when she was younger, she thought it was going to be money and houses, but really the inheritance she received from them was the kind of people they were and the kind of people, the kind of person they helped her to become. Most of what we receive from our families is good. Some of it isn't good. In this case, um, this is, so back in I guess back in 2005, I began leading a youth group in the city of Vancouver, somewhat near where this is, Little Mountain. And in about 2006, maybe early 2007, I connected with a whole bunch of teenagers who lived here and got them to come to our youth group. And one of those young men, he, um, he spent a ton, I spent a ton of time with him over maybe like five years. Probably I spent hundreds, hundreds of hours with him. And he had grown up in this housing complex in very much in a sort of welfare lifestyle. His mother didn't want to work, and so she'd actually worked very hard, <laughs> counterintuitive, she'd worked very hard to get him um, diagnosed with a number of different things so that he could have disability, even though he was not disabled. And so she had, prepared, she had prepared his life and prepared him to live this kind of I'm never going to work lifestyle. If you went into their home, I, the first time I went into their house at this complex, I couldn't stand the smell, actually. I had to kind of force myself not to say anything because they never washed anything, including clothes or themselves. So over the course of about five years, our whole church kind of rallied around this young man and tried to help him in every way. 
He had so many opportunities to get jobs, especially as an older teenager, and he almost took them. And there was this point in his life where it became clear he had to choose which way he was going to go. Am I going to, you know, keep going with this church or am I going to keep going with the lifestyle that I, I grew up in? And he chose the lifestyle that he grew up in. It was tragic to me. It still like twists my stomach when I think about it. But after that happened, what I realized was this, and this is the most important part for the illustration. What I realized was this. I spent hundreds of hours with him. But his family and the people who lived with him spent thousands and thousands of hours with him. And to really change his whole view of the world, it would have taken like adopting him. <laughs> it would have taken something much more even than like a youth group or a youth pastor could ever provide. It would have taken, it would have been a very high price. Very high price to pay. All right. We're in this series right now in the book of Romans, and this will be our last week in Romans for a little while. We're going to take a break, and we're going to do a series just about some of the basics of how we follow God. We're going to be talking about community and, and reading the Bible and serving other people over the next few weeks as we welcome some new, uh, new guests, a lot of new guests next Sunday. But we are in this series, and we'll come back to it. We're in Romans chapter 5, and here's a couple of the big points we've learned in Romans so far. You remember this one. We've said this one a lot of times. One of the big points, especially in the early chapters of Romans, is this. Everybody is so bad. Everybody is so bad on the inside that there's no way we can fix ourselves. It sounds like horrible news until you find out this, that you can receive God's goodness as a gift. You can receive it as a gift. God has made a way through his son, Jesus. And so we've been talking about, we're in, we said as, as we came into chapter 5 of Romans, Paul is addressing, in chapters 5 through 8, he's addressing this question. So, so there's the gospel. There's the message, the main message of the Bible. The good news is that even though we can't fix ourselves, God has made a way for us. And so he begins to address the question in chapters 5 to 8, so what difference does it make? What changes when you put your hope in God, when you start to follow him, when you have faith in God? What actually changes in you and how does that work? And last week we addressed the question, he was addressing the question, uh, is it too good to be true? This idea that I can't fix myself, the world is broken beyond repair, but God is going to come in and provide everything that's needed. Is that just too good to be true? We talked about that some last week, and today he's going to continue on this, uh, similarly on this question, is it too good to be true that one man came and died and that provides salvation? It provides a way out for the whole world. Have you ever thought about this? And this is the title of the message today. How can one man save the whole world? How can that even be possible? I know the Bible says it's true, but is that a reasonable thing to believe? There's lots of different answers to this question. Lots of different ways the Bible answers it. Answers it. Paul, in Romans chapter 5, answers it by talking about families. And in particular, the family of Adam and Eve, the family that all of us are part of. And then a different family, a family that we can join, the family of Jesus. So let's take a look here, at, first at the family of Adam and what Paul says in Romans chapter 5, starting at verse 12. Here's what he says. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone, uh, anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. So sin entered the world through one man, through one man and as a representative of his family, right? It was not just through him, it was through him and through his wife Eve. They both participated in that equally. Yes, equal partners in that marriage. And death came into the world through sin. 
And then death spread to all people because in Adam and Eve all sinned. Now, it might seem we're going to take a minute and look at the family of Adam and what that family was like, and we're going to think about that story for a moment. But it might seem unfair to us sometimes, right? It might seem like, okay, Adam sinned, but why should that mean that I suffer the consequences of that sin? But this is where our illustration is going to come in. That's just how families are. Somehow we are deeply connected to the people that we're related to, the people that bring us into this world and going all the way back. And there are things that we just can't escape in those families, aren't there? Most of it's good, but some of it's not good. There are patterns that keep recurring throughout the generations. It's fine to say, okay, Adam sinned, not me. That's not fair. I should have been given. You can say that, but it doesn't change the way things are. The way that Adam and his family were, the first human beings. This is the story the Bible tells us about what the first human family was like. And in doing so, it tells us everything we need to know about the rest of us human beings things that we are unable to escape on our own. So think about the family of Adam for a moment and some of the things uh, that were present in that family. You know the story, or you will have heard parts of the story. I'll just retell the outline a little bit, right? So Adam and Eve were created by God, and they're placed in a garden. And God makes a world that is very good. This is how it's described in the early chapters of Genesis. The world is very good. It's perfect. There's no sin in it. There's no death. Imagine a world, if you can, where there's no death. And none of the things that are like death, our hearts, we can't fully imagine what that world was like or will be like one day, but our hearts long for that world, don't they? Our hearts long for it. But in that world, of course, there was an enemy, a deceiver, a powerful spiritual being who was focused on evil and wanted to destroy Adam and Eve. And so that being Satan came to Eve and told her lies. And then Eve went to her husband Adam and told him the same lies and they believed the lies and did the one thing, right? God had given them one rule, one rule. Just don't eat from this one tree. And in fact, God had always intended them to have the things that would come through that tree later, I believe. Knowledge of good and evil. That's what the tree is called, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But they, the lie from Satan was that God is trying to hold you back. And if you think about it, this lie is present everywhere in our world today. It's such a source of all kinds of bad things for human beings. The belief that what God has told me to do, the good things that God has told me to do, those are just, God is just trying to restrict me. God is trying to hold me back from having fun or achieving what I could achieve on my own. And so Adam and Eve believe Satan. They believe that if they go around God's rule and do this thing, that in their own power, they can do better than they could do by following God. Why do they believe that lie? They believe it because they want to believe it. They believe it because of pride. Because they think, deep down, they think or want to think that they're better than God. So that's the first thing Adam and Eve believe. So it's kind of a dishonesty, right? They're not dealing in truth. They believe lies. And this is one of the things that carries through the entire human race that we cannot escape because we're all part of the family of Adam. We believe and we want to believe lies. Second thing is this. Adam and Eve believe that their way is better than God's way. So this is pride. This is pride, thinking that if God were just out of the way, if God were just removed, we could get it done. God is the one holding us back. Adam and Eve believed that their way was better than God's way. And we see this all throughout our human race, don't we? It's something that keeps on recurring. Even when some people, by the grace of God, manage to avoid this for the most part, it pops up again later. The belief that I can do it, I can achieve, I don't need God's power. It's so subtle, even for those of us who don't want to follow this way. Sometimes we feel trapped in it. And the third thing I'll point out about Adam and Eve is this. Adam and Eve are cowards who avoid the hard stuff. 
They're cowards who avoid the hard stuff. What they did in the garden, God always wanted them eventually to become the kind of beings, the kind of people who understood good and evil. The the tree that they're told not to eat from is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But God wanted them to get there by his plan, in his time, under his direction. And so he told them, don't eat from that tree. Don't go take it into your own hands and try and figure out what that is. Don't, Don't try and determine what's good and evil on your own. And so their desire to to achieve that, to become more and more like God, that was actually a God-given desire. But they want to get there without the hard work or the waiting. Don't raise your hand, but are you the kind of person who often knows the good thing that you want to get to, but you don't want the hard work or the waiting that's required to get to that good thing? That is the legacy of our ancestors living in us. That's it right there. So we can say it's not fair that God judges people uh, because Adam and Eve sinned, and yet we are part of their family. And that stuff that they did, the kind of family they had, it lives on in us. It comes back again and again. They were cowards who avoided the hard stuff. We're also told in the Bible that when Eve came to Adam, she had been totally brainwashed by Satan and believed that this was the right thing to do, was disobey God. But we're told by the Bible that Adam was not fully deceived. Adam knew that what they were doing was the wrong thing. And he went along with it anyway. Sometimes it's referred to as the silence of Adam. Adam says nothing in that situation. He brings him the fruit, says, let's do this thing that he knows is wrong. And he does not say no. He's afraid. He's afraid of confrontation. He's afraid of the hard stuff. How many times in your life have you been right there with him? Man. So that's the family of Adam, and we feel trapped in it. There's no way out. What would it take? I described in the beginning in the illustration my friend who was raised in this family with a welfare mentality. We're going to get everything for free. And what, we're not going to do any work, and we're going to live off of the government. That was what he was raised in. We tried to bring him out of that, but it wasn't enough. What would it take to bring someone out of the way that their family has been? And this is kind of, this is Paul's point in this section, as well as some other places in the New Testament, is the family of Jesus. Why is it that one man can save the world by dying on a cross? Because he doesn't just make a way for us to be forgiven. He begins a new family. He begins a new nation that's going to change the way people are on the inside. Let's read some more in Romans chapter 5. The gift that God is giving us through Jesus is not like the trespass. It's not like the thing that Adam and Eve did wrong. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. So here's what he's saying, right? What happened in Adam and Eve's family? Do you remember their family history at all? It's tragic. It's our family history. What happened to Adam and Eve had some kids, right? Cain and Abel, what did their kids do? One of them murdered the other one. That's the results of that kind of family. And that tells you everything you need to know about the human race on its own, apart from God. Their family just went on like that. So sometimes we look at the world and wonder, why is there so much war? Why does it seem like war never comes to an end? Because we're all part of this family. And yet Paul is saying here that by by creating a new way, God, just like one man, one man's family, being part of that family has caused all of these consequences for the human race. He's saying there's a new family. Because of what Jesus did, he's begun a new family. And there's now, because you can change families, because now there's a way to change and become part of the family of Jesus, there's now a way out. How much more did the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses 
and it brought justification. So making people right with God on the inside. That's an astonishing reality. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man. So the result of sin, remember, Cain and Abel killed each other, and then that just went on as they had more and more generations. Those generations killed each other. Death reigned through the one man. How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Jesus speaks the truth. So let's think for a minute just about the family of Jesus, okay? This isn't how all of his children are all the time. We are becoming more and more like this, but how was Jesus compared to Adam? Where Adam and Eve were dishonest. They were dishonest and they wanted to believe the lies. What do we see in the life of Jesus? We see that Jesus spoke the truth, even when it cost him his friends or his very own life. He spoke the truth. What else do we see? Adam and Eve were full of pride, right? They were not, they were not as great as Jesus, and yet they were full of pride, thinking that they were better than God. Jesus was equal to God, and yet he didn't think of himself that way. He came into the world with humility. Jesus knows that he can't do it alone. That's a, that's a stunning reality. In Hebrews, we're told that Jesus, during the days of his life on earth, cried out, to his Father in heaven for help. What? If Jesus needed help, what chance is there that we are going to achieve what we need on our own? Jesus knew he couldn't do it alone, and he constantly looks to God for help. That's what it means when he's calling God his Father over and over again. He's saying, what do I do in my life? I just watch what the Father wants me to do, and then I go and do it. Where Adam and Eve failed, Jesus succeeds. And Adam and Eve, remember, they were cowards and they were afraid to do the hard things, just like many of us are. What about Jesus? Jesus follows the Father even when it is the hardest thing ever. Literally the hardest thing ever. So Jesus did many hard things, telling people truth in situations they didn't want to hear it, facing persecution in different ways. Facing down Satan himself, remember, just like Adam and Eve were tempted by Satan, so was Jesus, yet Jesus overcomes in that moment with his faith in God, his Father. And on the cross, remember that night before he dies on the cross, he weeps. He's overwhelmed. He says his soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He sweats blood. He is facing the hardest thing that any human being will ever face. Not just the physical death, but the spiritual consequences of all our sin. And yet he does not back down or shy away from it. What does he say? Not my will, but your will, Father. Your will be done. And so where Adam and Eve fail, Jesus succeeds. And because of that, he is able to start a whole new family out of this human race. I'll tell you one more stunning thing. At that same time that I was trying to help this young man who was trapped in a welfare lifestyle, at that same time, in the same neighborhood, there was another family. The dad was a pastor, just like I was while moving into being a pastor. He was a little bit older than me. And there, they uh, we're trying to help a, a family very similar to this young man who I was trying to help, a family that was stuck in a, a lifestyle that was dysfunctional, uh, trapped in a kind of a welfare mentality. And you know what that family did, this pastor and his wife? They already had four kids of their own. They adopted four more children from an extremely broken and troubled family. What was the price of adopting those kids? do you think, on that family? High or low? I once, I once visited their church and one of their adopted children was literally running down the street trying to get away from them screaming. And they had to chase him down and calm him down and slowly bring him back to church. That's the kind of stuff they went through over and over again. And yet those kids, they're not perfect, but they have managed to escape 
the cycle, the welfare cycle that they were born into. Because a family came and adopted them. This is what Jesus is doing for us. We were born into the family of Adam, but Jesus calls us into a new family to be adopted into it so that we might have a chance to escape the things that we were born into under Adam's family line. Just as one trespass resulted in the condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act, Jesus' death on the cross, resulted in justification and life for all people. The possibility of it. We still have to receive the gift, but it is available to all human beings, even though we were born into Adam's family. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so through the obedience of the one man, Jesus, many will be made truly good on the inside. A new family. In a few chapters, in a couple of months we'll get here, Paul will close out this line of thinking with chapter 8. And in chapter 8, he says this, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. No longer the children of Adam and Eve, the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves. That's what you were born into. So that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption. A new family. Your adoption to sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. We have a new father and a new family if we choose to believe in and to follow Jesus. Let's live under his family so that we can and many others can escape the trap that came through our first ancestors. Let's pray. We'll continue in worship. Father in heaven,